Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan. I work on a project called StatusNet. And uh, today I'm going to tell you about how StatusNet works, go over the architecture, go over why we created it or why I created it, um, talk about what uh, StatusNet does and how it does it. And I'm also, because we're in the scalability track, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, Identica scales and how uh, StatusNet scales. We're not Facebook. We don't do a lot of the things that Facebook does, but for people who are just starting, uh, if you're making a move from, say, a medium-sized uh, website to a large-sized website, uh, we may have some interesting things for you to think about or, or, or do. Um, other people might find some of our scaling tips uh, less interesting, but you know you can just uh, follow along or feel smug or whatever. So I'm going to go through four parts of this uh, in this talk. The first one is about the problem that StatusNet tries to address. Sorry about that. Is that a little whistly, huh? I should thing. Um, anyways, the problem that StatusNet tries to address. Second thing is about the requirements, kind of factoring down what we really wanted to have come out of the StatusNet project. Third and the very longest part is the architecture of StatusNet, the different parts, how they work together, and that's specifically where I get into the scaling issues. Finally, uh, I'm going to talk about the future and where StatusNet is going. Can I ask a real quick question? How many people in here uh, are on Identica? Awesome. That's great. I like seeing that. How many people have uh, taken a look at StatusNet at all, the software? Good. Um, installed StatusNet and, and set it up. Okay, okay. I want to see more of those last hands. That's really where I want to be going. Um, so, I know this is kind of a bold statement, but it's something I think that's really important for us to do, say, is that in 2010, the most important software that we as free software people can be working on is web software. Web software is where it's at. We are splitting up the desktop uh, paradigm into small uh, clients and large clouds, and if we want to be players in this world, we have to be part of the web. Um, the web has become social. Sociality is an important part of what, what people use the web for. And finally, social has become status. What do I mean by that? People asking this question, what are you doing? What's on your mind? What are you working on? These little boxes pop up everywhere. This is, a, this is what people interact with on the web. A little box asking you a question. Status matters. Status is an important part of the social web. It's a very popular part. Everyone who knows about the popularity of Twitter knows that this is an, an important part of uh, the current uh, landscape of the web. Everyone who knows about Facebook knows that status updates are a central part of their system. But these status updates are, for the most part, completely disconnected. Status updates from uh, different parts of the web don't come together, and this uh, mesh of uh, sociality is not completely connected. And these systems are, by and large, closed. Uh, I think that uh, it's uh, fascinating to see how many uh, large websites use open source software to build their very large proprietary systems um, that we don't get to see the code of. Uh, it's cool that we get to see like the infrastructure stuff, but for the most part, very big websites keep their code to themselves. You can play with the client side. You can have an API or some kind of data feed sometimes, right? But the server side belongs to someone else. You can't control the rules of uh, how the server works. And for the large part, that server side represents you to the rest of the world. If you have an account on one of these systems, that server side is you. The client side is just a little listening device. Um, we need social software that we can own, that we can install and manage ourselves. We need social software that meshes into the existing social web. The social web right now is huge. What well, Facebook has like 400 million users, Twitter's got another 70 million users, MySpace has God knows how many users, right? It's like billions of people out there are using the social web. If we think that we're going to transfer everyone to a different social web, that's just not happening. We have to mesh into what's going to, what exists right now. But as usual, open source software, free and open source software, can lead the way to a more open web. Communication revolutions on the internet have always depended on free and open source implementations 
of open protocols to make uh, standards move forward. Because people who are experimenting with these standards need a no-cost, hackable way to get connected into this new network, into a new network. Email had SendMail. The web had Apache. Blogging had WordPress. We need free and open source software for making status networks. Now, some of you are probably saying, wait, it's kind of trivial stuff. You know, we're, we're, we're hackers. We don't, we don't really mess around with that, that kind of stuff. It's kind of silly. It's a, we don't do social. We're not social people. We do, you know, programming languages and text editors. That's our hacker stuff, right? Social software is for those shallow jerks um, that, you know, are really care about, like, SEO and personal marketing and stuff, right? That's not us. Well, that's wrong. That's just not the case. Social software is how people connect in our time, in 2010. It is the most important software that people are using right now. It connects people with their friends and their families. We all have them. Um, and for many people, their most important relationships are made and maintained online. If free software and open source software means anything, if it's going to be meaningful and relevant in the world of the 2010s, then we have to be participating in the social web. And we have to have a presence there. If we can't take on that challenge, pretty much what we do is, is pointless. We, we should just give it up because the world is moving to social software and if we are not moving with it, we're, we're blowing it. So I'm gonna reiterate one more time. We need free and open source web software for making status networks. All right, so you can tell that I care about this stuff, right? Um, so I'm gonna kind of lay into some of the re requirements that I see behind uh, uh, what we can do with that kind of software. First and foremost is that I think that any kind of uh, social web, social um, uh, status software has to work with the internet as it lives right now. And I know that this is gonna sound really basic to most people, but I get these questions all the time. I don't think we can require changes in the web architecture just to make our software work. This is about playing catch up. And uh, we need to work with the internet as it is now, not try and make it change. That means that the internet as it is now has many small, unaddressable clients. We're all using one right now, right? Your IP address that you're using right now, you didn't know 10 minutes ago, right? And uh, no one can reach you on it yet. Uh, and we have a few large and addressable servers, our web servers, our email servers. These are places, a uh, hub and spoke architecture. It's the web, it's the way things work right now, right? P2P mesh networks, they're awesome, they're great. I'm really looking forward to when we have a P2P mesh network anarchy going on, and it's gonna be awesome. But if we are gonna wait to participate in uh, innovation on the social web until we've got the P2P mesh blah, blah, blah uh, utopia, we're, we're doomed. That's, that's just, that's a long way down the line, and uh, I'm not gonna wait for that. Um, however, I do think that the way that we can uh, be participating in this social web is by providing the piece of this social web that is distributed and decentralized. SMTP is a good model of how a social web can work uh, that is distributed and decentralized. We form natural groups around uh, workplaces, uh, areas of interest, geography, or you know just where you get your network uh, connectivity, right? Your ISP or whatever. Um, and then these networks are federated through simple, really simple, agreed upon standards. Um, I think that uh, social web software that we develop has to be private or public. We have to allow uh, one or both. Different kinds of uh, groups are gonna approach social networks at different paces. Some people are gonna be really ready for this meshed out, uh, distributed, decentralized system. Other people are gonna wanna set up their own private social network, see how it works first. And uh, that's something that we have to be able to do. Fourth, and very importantly, is uh, scalability. Now, scalable is the way that web people say not broken, right? You know, you say, is it scalable, right? And that just means, is it gonna work, right? So, um, when I say scalable, I mean, 
can it work at different levels on a size scale? If we look at like a logarithmic scale of the size of a community or size of a group, going all the way from one person on that far left side up to what is this, uh, hundreds of millions of people over on the, over on the left side, um, you know, we need to be able to reach across that scale. Groups as small as uh, uh, an individual or a family going up to, you know, larger groups like a, a school or a church or a small company into much bigger groups like a global web community, this would be your like Slashdot or something, uh, a large town, a university or a large company, all the way up to very large uh, groups, very large uh, uh, installations, an ISP or a mobile phone network that would be providing an installation, or a huge consumer website. I think our software that we develop has to work across this entire scale. It has to be easy to install on that small end, an individual should be able to set up and use uh, our software, but there should be a clear upgrade path as groups either grow or shrink or the software is applied um, to different purposes. Finally, I think that uh, any kind of important uh, software has to follow the developing trend in social software of of being accessible anywhere. By that I mean that you should be able to reach the software using a mobile device, using a desktop device. Uh, it should be accessible using other websites. And uh, people have just gotten really used to being able to get their data in and out really easily to different devices. Um, so we have to have secure APIs built into the software um, that provide remote access. So. Now that I've laid out my requirements, I'm going to go into the architecture of uh, StatusNet. And I'm doing pretty good on my time. Um, this is where I do deep dive, right? So um, if there are anything in here that sounds like really crazy or weird, uh, ask me questions at the end because there's probably a good answer. Um, so in developing uh, StatusNet, this is also where I go from these like big generalities to my actual personal uh, ideas and belief and where the, where the rubber hits the road, right? And uh, if you're developing an open source web piece of software today, um, it means LAMP stack, right? You can take all your different, uh, you know, frameworks and blah, blah, blah. If you want d wide distribution of an open source platform uh, today on the web, it's got to be LAMP. Now, LAMP is like Linux, Apache, My, MySQL, and PHP, right? You can like switch stuff around, with, put some FreeBSD in there where the Linux used to be, or put some Lighty in there, or PostgreSQL, or whatever, right? But the basic architecture is going to be a web front end, PHP doing some execution, and an RD, RDBMS uh, providing the back end. And this is what, what's available on commodity web hosting right now. It's actually what's available on like mid-size web hosting. It's uh, you have to kind of move pretty far up the line before you start getting any other kinds of uh, programming languages or uh, runtimes that you that you can use. So um, anything that's supposed to have a wide distribution, supposed to be used by a lot of people, is going to have to use this kind of stack. If it's going to be easy and cheap to install, it's got to be LAMP. The other great thing is that there uh, is a huge community of uh, Floss LAMP developers. Uh, out there. There's great packages that are already uh, in use. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's one of the main reasons that uh, we went with LAMP or I went with LAMP in developing this software. Um, MediaWiki, uh, Drupal, uh, WordPress, um, the list goes on and on. Uh, if, you, if you want to reach out to that uh, great group of developers, you have to meet them uh, with the languages and the uh, systems that they're already working with. Um, with the uh, StatusNet software, I, I chose not to use a, a web framework like uh, Cake or Symfony or whatever, right? There are a lot of really nice uh, web frameworks uh, for PHP. Uh, I didn't I decided not to use them. I got a couple of reasons. Um, one is that uh, it tends to be, these frameworks tend to be aimed towards um, people who are developing software for their own internal use it can be a little bit difficult to make software that you're going to redistribute and share. But the other thing that I find is that when I'm using frameworks, I, I find myself writing to the framework instead of writing to the requirements. And I really wanted to write software that was going to work 
for the problem at hand. So um, StatusNet as it is does not use a web framework, but it uses a very simple model for its web, uh, web processing that practically anyone in this room who's ever done anything, even remotely software development, is going to easily recognize. Uh, we have a front-end controller system that, um, based on uh, parameters that come in through uh, GET or URLs, um, uh, uh, instantiates a particular action. That action uses one of a number of data classes to um, access the database, um, do operations, business operations on that data, and generate output for the user. Um, our controller uses a pair library called net URL mapper, uh, which is kind of nifty. I think it's uh, pretty cool because it generates URLs backwards and forwards. So if you provide it with a path, it will generate out some uh, parameters. If you provide it with parameters, it'll generate out the path. I think that's pretty neat um, and, and it works pretty well. Um, DB data object is the uh, framework we use for database access. This is another pair uh, system. It's, uh, it's okay. It's uh, based on, uh, it, it can use either pair DB or pair MDB2. Uh, does not yet support PDO, which is kind of, you know, uh, depressing, but uh, it'll be nice when it eventually does. Um, I think pair libraries are great. I totally recommend people use them. Uh, they're usually the best thing that, that you could get to, and hey, someone's going to work on them eventually, right? Or they're going to fork them and make a new one. So. Um, I, I like using pair libraries. Uh, some of the things that we model in our system, and this is where I start getting a little bit uh, floaty about our system. Uh, our system has users, obviously. Users have a presence. Uh, we also model remote users in our system so that uh, if uh, you subscribe to someone over a remote system, uh, we keep a kind of uh, mirror record of that person's uh, profile information. We retain profile information. Profile is information about you. Uh, what's your name? What's your biography? What's your um, location? What is your um, uh, home page? Some things like this. Um, we, also, we also keep avatars in various sizes um, that are uh, uh, stored with the profiles. So like I said, this is, the, this is what the profile data uh, includes. Um, the, model of uh, our system, uh, it's called following or friending in other social networks. We call it subscriptions just because that's kind of not very weighted and it works, works okay for, you know, business use as well as, uh, as, well as personal use. Um, saying that your boss is your friend uh, doesn't always make a lot of sense and telling your friends to follow you uh, also seems kind of asinine and rude. Um, so simply subscribing to someone's information is kind of neutral and not, doesn't really uh, carry a lot of loaded uh, sense to it. However, uh, we have a, um, uh, we do store subscriptions as a separate uh, uh, entity within the system. Subscriptions have some uh, relational attributes uh, about them, uh, dealing with how they, how uh, information in the uh, subscription gets delivered. Uh, finally, and most importantly, in this kind of core triumvirate, of uh, users, subscriptions, and notices is the notices uh, classes. Um, these would be called status updates or tweets in other systems. Uh, we call them notices, again, because tweet is a stupid name. Um, notices uh, have a, a considerable amount of uh, data attached. Uh, some of the things that are pretty interesting about the way that we stored notices, notices are plain text objects. They can be a variable size. Um, they can be limited down to 140 characters to be Twitter compatible. They can also be of infinite length if that's what you want to do. Um, they're rendered at save time. We do a rendering process where we take all those funny little codes like the little at sign and the hash sign and we turn it into HTML. We derive all the information about the, uh, uh, the extra metadata about the notice at that time. Um, they're stored individually. We don't store them. Um, uh, in any kind of uh, uh, bunch or, or bundle, um, which some systems try to do with messaging. Um, they each have a unique uh, integer ID that is an auto-updating ID, and they refer to their, they re refer to various other records in the database, their own author, 
Um, they may be in reply to another uh, notice. They may be a repeat or a retweet of another notice. We also keep a conversation ID that's a unique thread ID. If I make a reply to you, you make a reply to someone else, that uh, thread ID stays with all those notices. Uh, we, re we, re we retain uh, information about tags. In our system, you can include hashtags in a, uh, in a notice. Uh, those tags are retained as a separate record for easy um, indexing. We also allow t the tagging of profiles. So you can tag people um, that you know and group them together, and you can use those tags to organize people that you know. Or in a community, people who have common interests can tag themselves with uh, terms like Ubuntu or Fedora or you know, skiing, and uh, you can find other people uh, using those tags. Uh, we also store information about favoriting. This is saying that I have, uh, I have favored this notice. I think this notice is good or bad. Um, here, I, I've been talking about you know, trying to use professional sounding names, and we do use fave for, for this thing. One of the things that's different about StatusNet from some other uh, status uh, sharing systems is that we have a concept of groups. Groups are like an uh, email mailing list. So you can uh, address a notice or status to a group, and that will get distributed out to everyone in that group, whether or not they're individually subscribed to you in particular. So if you have a group um, that's uh, organized around your particular work group or people who have a sh share a common interest, um, one of the largest groups on Identica is around Ubuntu. I think it's greater than 4,000 people on this mailing list or on this distribution list. Groups have a whole bunch of data that's associated with them. They have members. They have logos. They have descriptions. Uh, they have some uh, admin lists, things like that. And uh, direct messages are a different kind of structure that we have in, in our system. Uh, direct messages are very similar to notices. However, they're only for distribution between two people, so we store them in a different, uh, different place. The sender and the receiver are the only people who can actually read them. Um, like some, some systems, we uh, store attachments. So you can actually attach a file or a, um, or a link to a, uh, to a notice, and that attachment stays with the notice. You can use this to, say, upload pictures or add sound. Uh, StatusNet makes a, actually a pretty good uh, low-cost uh, podcasting system. Uh, you could just attach a, uh, an MP3 file to a, to a notice, and, and there you go. You've got simple podcasting. Um, attachments have their own little subsystem in our, uh, in our architecture. They have, uh, uh, we keep a uh, record within the, the system, but we also keep the, uh, the files on a, out on the file system. Uh, various bits of plumbing that are related to uh, serving web pages, so things like uh, setting remember me tokens, web sessions, we have OAuth data that we use. Um, another thing, <coughs> and this is where I start talking about some uh, design uh, issues. So for those of you who've been wondering when I'm going to get to that, here's where I get to it. Uh, we have uh, inboxes in our system. I think I was talking, this is the uh, data structure that lets us serve you, know, you and your friends uh, what's been happening to you. This is by far the most important part of our system. It's where people go first. Because uh, if you're reading the web page, you really want to find out what's going on with you and your friends. Um, our uh, API, which I'm going to get to in a second, this is um, this, the equivalent API call for this is the biggest uh, hit getter for us on Identica. I think something like 40% of the hits that we get are for um, the inbox, uh, the you and your friends, friends timeline. Um, and uh, so what is this data structure that I'm talking about with inboxes? Basically, I think I've, I've laid out that you have a user who might be subscribed to another user who posts a notice. Now, one way that we could set, uh, create this inbox, and in fact, the way that uh, I originally kind of spiked this out was that we did join. We said, you know, hey, uh, what are the most recent notices that have been posted by someone that you are subscribed to? Um, incredibly inefficient. Really, really bad idea. Uh, it uh, turned out to be really viciously uh, underperforming for us. Uh, it's like a three-way join across like three tables. 
uh, very, very difficult. Nicely structured, very great that way, but uh, very bad performance. So um, somewhere along the line in the development of Stasnet, uh, we moved to uh, right time delivery. So this means that when someone posts a notice, instead of later, you know, that you go and lazily say, what has he said lately, um, it gets delivered at right time. So every time that someone posts a notice, we put a, we have a data structure for notice inboxes where we put a reference to that notice into your inbox in the correct order. Now, formerly we had a table that looked something like this. It was a notice inbox table that said, this user has this notice in their inbox. Um, this worked out okay a little bit. It was a great improvement over the join there, but uh, you can imagine that this gets really, really big, really fast. People who have, you know, hundreds of subscriptions um, and, you know, each of those subscriptions are generating, you know, five or ten notices a day um, and you have hundreds of thousands of people on your website, pretty soon this table gets completely unusable. I think that when we finally moved away from this uh, system, we were at like 200 million records in the table. Um, so it's, uh, we, we instead moved to a uh, denormalized uh, system that keeps a great big blob of packed notice IDs. So each user has a big blob of packed notice IDs. Um, this is the system we currently use. It is very fast. It's, uh, we can update it atomically using some tricky uh, syntax um, that works pretty well on both MySQL and PostgreSQL. I, I'm, I'm a little scared to see what's going to happen if we ever try and port it to any other uh, RDBMSs, but for right now it seems to work, and it's, uh, it, it's really, really fast. Um, so that's the inbox. Uh, the, uh, some other parts of the system that I kind of want to go over, uh, the architecture. Um, our plugin architecture uses an event hooks model. That means that in different parts of the code, there uh, are marked as events. And plugins can register an interest in those events, and they are called when that event happens. Um, this works a lot like uh, MediaWiki does. And uh, I, I, the reason is, is that I wrote MediaWiki's system, and, and I wrote this system too, so they're about the same. Uh, we have all kinds of different we have all kinds of different events that happen in the, uh, in the uh, system that, that plugins can, uh, can hook. Uh, some plugins are very interested in modifying data. Other uh, plugins are more interested in modifying the UI. But they can hook events like when the site logo is shown, or when a new notice is saved, or when a new user registers, or when uh, a user has entered their password and they want to, and we're authenticating it. Every important event in the system in the lifetime of the application um, and its data set is, uh, is hookable. Uh, at least we hope so. That's what we'd like to get to. It's not quite there yet. Um, the kind of neat thing is that plugins have a lot of options with these events. They can just examine the event. They can watch it go by and maybe log it or you know, have some side effect. They can alter the event. They can change the data as it's going by. They can also reject the event. We use this for uh, typically for spam filters. So if a user tries to register and they're coming from a known bad IP address or they're using you know, a bad nickname, then we can reject it. Or if they post a notice that has a bad URL in it, we can reject it. Finally, they can completely replace the, uh, the default code. And we use this for things like our LDAP authentication plugin. Um, Plugins can also add their own actions. Like I was saying before, actions are what show a page or show output or do something in the web world. Uh, they can add their own data types. All those data types that I just listed out are just the core data types. We have all kinds of data types that happen within our plugin environment. They can add widgets that show things, uh, different kinds of things on the page. And they can also add um, uh, handlers. I don't know why I wrote that. Um, so uh, the, speaking about uh, LDAP and authentication, uh, our security auth architecture is relatively simple, but I think it's pretty robust. We have a pluggable authentication system, which means that um, 
you can inc in we, ha we have just username password system in the core, right? It, it gets you up and running. Um, but because the system is very pluggable, you can we have a number of different plugins that can use different kinds of authentication. We use OpenID authentication uh, in a plugin. We also have Facebook uh, Connect uh, authentication sign in with Twitter. We have an LDAP authentication plugin in our core system. So we think that our authentication is flexible enough that pretty much any kind of authentication that you wanted to do, you know, barring the really weird stuff, um, we could probably get away with doing in our system. Um, we also have a role-based authorization system. That means that we assign roles to uh, users within the system, and those roles get particular rights. Um, we have a bunch of default roles, but as I've been kind of pointing out, um, different roles can be added or overridden by the plugins. So the default behavior of a, plug of a role might be overridden by a, another plugin. Um, another thing that we have that's part of the system is a Twitter-like API. Uh, I wish that our API was like a little weirder or, or more different, but it's very similar to our web architecture. The same kind of browser interface that I was talking about before um, is the way that our, our Twitter-like API works. And if you think about it, that's really the right way for it to do it. It's a web-based API, um, and uh, you know that's it, so it uses the same kind of system. It just puts out JSON or XML instead of HTML. Um, we support SMS, kind of. Uh, we currently have this kind of bastardized uh, SMS to email gateway system, which is pretty chunky. We're going to be replacing this in an uh, upcoming version with uh, a little more robust SMS uh, gateways. Um, there's not a huge demand for SMS use uh, from us. SMS is expensive uh, if you get up to you know, any kind of level, and people don't seem to want to do it uh, on the public web. But uh, we, use a, we use a model that just kind of abuses existing SMS email gateways. So if you've got, you give us your phone number and your carrier, and we know the carrier, we'll get out the uh, well-known email address for that number, and we'll just use an email gateway to send you SMS messages and receive SMS from you. It's not great, but it works. Um, one of the most interesting things I think about StatusNet, one of the things that I was most doing okay, one of the things I was most uh, excited about uh, early on is the open microblogging standard. So open microblogging is our standard for remote subscriptions and remote uh, delivery of, of, of messages. Um, it's a homebrew protocol. I just kind of made it up, made it up because there wasn't anything that did, did this um, at the time. This was 18 months ago. Um, it's a person-to-person -person subscription, so you can only subscribe to an individual person. It doesn't support groups or you know, subscribing to a list of people. And it also only pushes plain text. Um, it uses OAuth. Hey, I got one in there at least. It uses OAuth for subscription. Um, and kind of the semantics of it is that you authorize a server to push someone's notices into your inbox. Um, we have an XMPP interface. This is effected using the XMPHP library, which is a great library for uh, XMP with PHP. Uh, we have an offline daemon that receives notices, uh, or excuse me, receives messages from people uh, using XMPP or Jabber. Uh, and then it gateways those into our system. Um, we have a Twitter interface and a Facebook interface. Like I was saying, very important to be uh, plugged into the existing social networks. Um, we push notices out into those networks. So if you post on uh, your own StatsNet system, it pushes out to Facebook and Twitter if you set that up. Uh, you can also pull subscribe notices back into your system to read them on your own. Uh, it's a user-to-user -user tunnel, so in order for it to work, uh, in order for the Twitter tunnel to work, you have to have a Twitter account, and you push through your Twitter account and pull back through. Um, it uses your account on that remote system. Um, so uh, a lot of the work, I, I said some work there, but a lot of the work that's uh, kind of time-intensive or uses, uses external systems or fans out pretty high, uh, we use uh, offline offline queuing servers to, uh, to um, affect those, that work. So things like outgoing XMPP messages, outgoing SMS messages, uh, and these OMB messages that go out to other systems, this all happens on uh, back-end systems. 
uh, optionally. You can, by default, they'll happen at web time, and usually we expect that you, know, you would have very little of this configured on a system that couldn't handle uh, having some offline processing. Uh, these are PHP processes, and uh, the main reason that I did this, um, PHP isn't really the best um, system for creating uh, long-running daemons. Uh, it doesn't have a threading model. Um, creating child processes is a little crazy and complicated, and uh, a lot of libraries aren't really built for running for more than like two seconds or five seconds, right? So um, they tend to leak a lot of memory. But uh, you know, we've uh, offset that downside with the upside that um, if we use PHP for our offline uh, queue handlers, we can um, use the same libraries and use the same, uh, most of the same stack that we use for our web system. So uh, our, consequently, our queue handlers are very small and dense because they use the same uh, libraries that the web system does. Now, you know, the downside of this is that a lot of our libraries are leaky. We try to patch them a lot, but, uh, you know, we, we do see some growth in, uh, in memory with all these child processes. Fortunately, we've got a pretty sophisticated um, uh, memory management. Well, it's not really memory management. It's like bad child management. If, if children start uh, growing too hard, growing too far, since they're only taking on small tasks, each one, if they grow too big, will kill utter, uh, um, child processes that are too leaky while they're idle. Um, our queuing is, once again, pluggable. Um, we can use a number of different queuing systems. One is a uh, pretty clunky DB-based polling system. So basically, we just dump stuff into a big table and check and see if anything new is in that table. Um, if you can run something a little bit better, we support the Stomp protocol. We have a Stomp plugin, so servers like ActiveMQ or uh, RabbitMQ uh, will work too. Um, we're looking at some of the other uh, offline queuing servers. There are a lot of great ones out there, um, and uh, you know, uh, I've I've personally done plugins for Gearman and AMQP, which is the native uh, protocol for RabbitMQ. Um, there's a very interesting pair of um, servers called Kestrel and Starling, which are what uh, Twitter use. Um, another interesting thing about our uh, architecture is our location support. We use structured locations. They're identified by integers. The uh, integers are um, namespaced using another uh, integer namespace. So, for example, this location, Brussels, Belgium, is stored as two integers, uh, that long number, and then one says it's a GeoNames uh, ID. We support other um, databases of locations, like Yahoo Geo, OSM Namefinder, uh, name finder, so that's WOE IDs. Uh, OSM has their own system, uh, and we, we actually can have other vocabularies, once again, it's pluggable, um, and even private systems. We also store lats and longs if we need to. Uh, Brussels may not be at the right granularity. You might need more uh, in location. We support pluggable systems for Real time in the browser. Um, we, we support a lot of the comment based systems. I'm really interested in using more XMPP, um, but we're, we haven't had really time to make that happen yet. So, down to the scaling part. I know everybody's waiting for that. Um, what have we done to, for scaling? There are some things that we support for scaling, and this gets us pretty far. One is that we move uh, stack files off of our uh, Apache system, and you can move them into a CDN or just a remote server. So we let Lighty or Nginx serve our, state, uh, our, our stack files, and then we keep Apache just for doing PHP type stuff. This uh, really kind of lets our uh, Apache systems uh, go crazy. Um, so we move practically everything that doesn't have a heartbeat off onto external servers. Uh, second is that we use a master-slave replication for a database server. We, uh, most of our hits are gonna be read-only, um, not entirely. We get a lot of, you know, you can imagine that uh, we get a lot of pushes, a lot of posting, and that has a lot of, uh, like I said, a lot happens at right time, so that has a kind of cascading effect. But uh, most of our hits are read-only, so we can mark each action. We do it as granularity of the action or page, and we direct those queries to a slave server. Uh, we also use memcached uh, almost to a fault. 
Um, we've uh, taken that DB data object, we've added a wrapper around it that just pretty much caches everything, caches anything that moves. Uh, we cache on read, we cache on write, we cache single objects, we cache query results that are, that are compound objects. Um, we even keep old invalid results have, that have been invalidated by, by new data, um, and that way we can, so if we have a list of notices, we can pr just prepend new, new results onto them, and that really um, speeds things up for us too. Uh, we use pluggable caching systems, so we have uh, different models. We use memcached by default, but you can also use APC or xcache uh, variable caching. You can cache the disk. You can actually just cache the memory. Um, and then finally, you know, one of the main things that we do for scaling is that we try and push as much as we can to offline processing. So this is these queue servers I was talking about. Um, we use queues for most of the less visible activities at notice write time, things like distributing uh, notices to somebody else's uh, inbox. Usually, if you post a notice, you don't notice that it, it didn't get to people's, other people's inboxes immediately, and they don't notice that you just posted it. So uh, we have a little bit of spare time in there, a few seconds, like 30 seconds, maybe a minute, before you actually notice that, it, that it's going out. And so we can actually do that work um, offline. <sighs> Good. I'm glad I'm over with that one. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the future of StatusNet. I think I'm, time's up. I'm going to go fast. <laughs> I'm almost done. Uh, we've got a new release coming out in two weeks. Um, it will coincide with the uh, launch of our new StatusNet cloud service. Um, we have a private beta right now. If you're interested in using the private beta, that is the coupon code to use, FOSDEMX. Um, and we will get you a, your very own StatusNet site if you want to play with it. Probably the neatest thing is that we have a, a new um, remote subscription system set up called OStatus. It's based on these cool things instead of my hacked up system. Um, it supports this great stuff. We're also going to be supporting privacy, not in this version, but a later version. Uh, we're going to be supporting more data sharding by user and by time. Uh, and I hope to see better integration with existing software, uh, especially existing free web software. Uh, I'd like to see us have a JavaScript widget only interface, more federation protocols, uh, have more web cache friendliness, and most of all, I want to have more people involved. So, um, you know, if, if this thing is going to go, you're, I, I really hope that you can be part of it. Uh, you can find us on status.net or on Gatorius status.net. Um, we need help with plugins, themes, core development, integration, testing, promotion, and use. Um, thanks a lot. I, I'm over my time, so <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Evan. Um, well, now we have about a little less than 10 minutes for question and answer. And during this question and answer section, I would ask you to, uh, to stay seated or if you want to leave, to be very quiet in respect for the speaker and for the ones who have questions. So are there any questions? <laughs> Just show up and we'll come to you. Oh. Where's it going? Way up there. Uh, well, uh, I wanted to ask if uh, your open uh, microblogging uh, uh, protocol supports uh, sets, uh, not only a notification, but sets between the uh, different sites. Search like uh, certificates, like like, like uh, uh, searching from uh, no, one. No, uh, it doesn't uh, support search. Mm -hmm. Nope. Uh, uh, no, and it probably won't. Distributed search is a really hard problem to make work uh, in a decentralized system. I think that any time for the for the foreseeable future, we need to be able to share this data out to centralized uh, search systems. And, uh, and that's really the only realistic way to make this kind of thing search. We do support search in each uh, individual uh, instance. And so you can search your own inbox. You can search stuff that's happened to you. But a global search really depends on having a global uh, uh, search system. Thanks. Um, what advantage does um, Apache have to you over um, li um, light HTTPD or Nginx for um, PHP. For PHP? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's like, I don't know. We just, uh, you can use our software with either one. 
right? You can use it with Lighty or, or with Nginx, I think. Um, but uh, we just happen to use uh, Apache more often. I think we're just more comfortable with it. And uh, there are some there are some tricky parts with using the FC, uh, fast CGI um, to make uh, to make things work. So it's not it's not grievous. It works, um, but I think that there are some tricky points, and uh, it didn't work very well at scale for us. Yeah. Uh, why did you choose not to use XMPP as uh, the core platform? What's that? Why did you choose not to use XMPP as the core platform? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think XMPP is an awesome platform. It has a lot of the things that uh, we need for distributed sociality. It's got domains involved. It's distributed. It's got a great authentication system. It has this whole federated model. It's got a client-to-client -client and server-to-server -server protocols. All of that is great. The one thing that XMPP does not have is the install base on the kind of uh, um, commodity web servers that I wanted to that I want uh, our software to install in, right? So I really want our software to work in a, uh, the same kind of installation profile as, say, WordPress, so that you could set up your own social, social networking hub um, in the same place or maybe on the same server that you would run WordPress. And right now, those servers don't provide you with uh, excuse me, those uh, kind of hosting systems don't provide you with an XMPP server. I think that there's a great opportunity, and I, I mentioned it in the, in the um, uh, very briefly in my kind of future thing, that there's a great opportunity in supporting more of the uh, uh, XMPP for microblogging and for federation. There's some really interesting uh, work that's gone on in just the last couple of months with uh, federation for uh, microblogging using XMPP, and I'd like to see us support it. Um, but I don't think it can be the only answer if we're going for that low end. Yep. Can, you, can you share any numbers uh, on the status of federation using open microblogging in terms of number of users or the federation and, and what you plan to do in the future to, to increase that interconnections between the Identica domains? Sorry, say that one more time. I didn't quite understand. So do you have any numbers to share of the federation? So how many oh, yeah. people are remotely interconnected? Yeah. Yeah, so the last number, so one of the kind of cool things about StatusNet is we've got, um, we get a little ping back from uh, installations that are out in the wild. Um, and we have something like uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 public sites that are using StatusNet right now, right? Uh, the numbers that we have on that, uh, the number of users that they report is somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2 million users. So it's a, a fairly big uh, chunk. Of that, 120,000 are on Identica itself. So um, Identica represents the lion's share of that, of that network, but is not the majority um, at all. So it's a big chunk, but it's not it. So there are a lot of people on this network already that are using StatusNet. And uh, I hope that uh, with the launch of our cloud service, there's going to be much, much more. We have uh, something like uh, 15,000 pre-signups for our private beta of uh, the cloud service. We've been putting about a thousand uh, new sites up over the last few weeks, every couple days. So um, my expectation is that we'll be, you know, somewhere around twenty thousand when we actually do launch the uh, cloud service. Sorry, if, sorry if you already answered that. What is the relation between Status.net and Laconica? Yeah, it's a change in name. Uh, Laconica was the name that uh, I launched with. People didn't get it. Um, uh, and the status net name is a little clearer for people. It just really says that you're going to send out your status to your social network. Um, I, I was very fond of the original name, Laconica, um, but uh, it, it means like, you know, short or brief. Um, and uh, it just didn't quite resonate with people. And uh, status net has picked up a lot better. That's all. <laughs> Hi. Here. Ah, there, there. Um, if I understood correctly, when you talked about memcached, you said you cache both your objects, but also your query results. Yeah. Doesn't that mean you cache a lot of things twice? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> That's the, uh, so we actually, when we cache query results, we don't cache the entire object. We just cache the primary key of the object. So if we, uh, say if we cache your inbox, we don't, uh, cache all the notices that are in that inbox. We actually just cache the uh, notice ID of each item, 
right? And that's, uh, that means that we, we're not caching twice and we don't have to validate in lots of different places uh, when something's deleted or overwritten. Um, we're kind of lucky in that our notices are immutable, so you can't actually um, uh, overwrite them, but you can delete them. Uh, the, uh, so, so the answer is no, <laughs> but, uh, but it is something that, that we worry about quite a bit. The, uh, the nice thing is that because we just uh, cache the ID in those query results, uh, we got a lot better cache hits because the same notice will appear in lots of, peop lots of people's inboxes or, you know, in lots of, lots of places. So, yeah, the uh, uh, more current notices almost always show up uh, in the cache more, more often because more people are looking at them. Other questions? Yeah. So, hi. So first of all, let me thank you for StatusNet because it's one of the success stories which highlights the fact that free software is about freedom in all the software we use and social software should be no exception. So thank you for this. Thank you. And then a, political, a kind of political question. So it's really unfortunate that Twitter does not support open microblogging. I wonder whether if you have ever asked yourself it will ever happen. If, if that'll ever happen? Yeah, if it will ever happen to have this kind of support in proprietary. So, um, you know, my, uh, if you had asked me like two years ago or a year and a half ago, I would have said no. I would have said that's not, that's not on the agenda. Um, I think that uh, for large networks, um, they would not be interested in seeing an expansion um, to a federated system because it's uh, not in their interest, right? They, what they sell to their advertisers or to their um, investors is a captive network and if they don't have a captive network and they're pa participating in an open federated system, it's less uh, of a good sale to them. That was my, that would be my point of view, say, 18 months in, ago. A lot has changed since then. There has been a lot of movement um, along the lines of federation. Um, things are really happening very quickly right now. Um, a lot of those subjects that I showed up, up um, in the O status uh, uh, slide, uh, things like PubSub Hubbub, the Salmon Protocol, Webfinger, um, and uh, activity streams are really picking up a lot of uh, usage. MySpace, for example, is the, is the big push behind activity streams, and they're sharing a ton of data out into the world using this activity streams model. So I think that um, with a open source, uh, free and open source uh, implementation of an open web uh, open social web standard, we might see more movement by the big, uh, big networks to do it. Um, I don't think we can wait for that, um, so I think that we have to use the APIs that these networks are providing uh, in order to mesh into them uh, right now, but uh, you know, my ideal would be eventually to see more of those networks providing federation between each other and with an open source implementation like StatusNet. Okay, we are running short of time, so uh, running out of time. There's one last question over here, and then oh, we're heading for the closing talk. Uh, how does open micro, micro, micro blogging and Identica place itself relative to Google's open social? What's, that, what's the interface with open social? What, yeah, what's the interface? Are, you, are, you, are uh, they competitors? The comparison, the comparison. Yeah, I think that open social, so um, open social is a, uh, it's like an API that uh, was developed originally at Google, I think, and it's got a lot of, uh, it's got a lot of support from people. Uh, different uh, organizations are using it. LinkedIn uses it. MySpace uses it. I think High Five and uh, Bebo have announced support for it, but they may not have it actually running. Uh, Ning uses it. Um, Orkut has it in a sandbox. So there are a lot of systems that use this. Open Social is a really cool system for creating uh, widgets that run inside a social network and you can get access into that social network. However, it is not a federation system. So you can't use open social to subscribe to your friend on Bebo from a friend on High Five, right? And for some of the services, um, if you tried to make a system to do that and plugged it into open social, uh, your open social widget would get yanked, right? That's not part of what they think that open social is supposed to do. That said, open social supports a lot of the same kind of things that uh, the, the same kind of development model that um, StatusNet supports. So it's a 
uh, activity streams or, or status updates are an important part of the um, uh, open social model. And uh, we hope to have the same kind of integration that we have now with Facebook and Twitter uh, with uh, open social sites like, like LinkedIn. So it's not an open federation system in the same way that open microblogging or the new O status is. However, uh, we think that we can use it in order to give users of StatusNet a presence in these networks. So good news for the, uh, for the audit audition. Uh, well, um, we have ten, I was just been told that we have 10 more minutes. So if you have any more questions, really? take your chance. Uh, Evan is still here. So it's open again. <laughs> There's more, wow. Um. Hi. Um, uh, Facebook now keeps adding more stuff into your status. So you only have, in the beginning, you only had your status, and now you can like or dislike other people's status, or you can comment on them. Is this supported in the platform, or will it ever be? Or? Yeah, so uh, our. Uh, let me, let me see how to say this. Uh, Facebook has a really interesting model of how they do things. And uh, it's, it's, I, I love how they do statuses. And I think that it's a lot more sophisticated than some other um, microblogging platforms. So I think it's pretty cool how, stat, uh, how, how Facebook works. We support faving, but we can't support uh, remote faving. It's just not part of the way the API works. Um, we support attachments, and we can actually support remote attachments that go into Facebook. However, we, our, our big problem with Facebook is that we can't pull data back out. So we can't take your, your, your posts and repost them on to, onto an open network. It's just part of the Facebook terms of service. So, and we, we try not to get kicked off Facebook, because then, then we couldn't use it at all. I mean, I, th I think someone could do it with StatusNet, but I don't think it would make a lot of sense. It would just get you kicked off. So uh, I, I think that Facebook has a really interesting model. And uh, you know, Facebook is part of the uh, activity streams uh, process. Uh, they're very active in it. And uh, my hope is that you know, as they start publishing their feeds more often, uh, we can actually be uh, participating in that network a little bit more. Are there any more questions? <laughs> Hello. Um, so, a question about um, enterprise use of uh, status.net. Um, so, how many customers, we you know, just rough numbers, are using status.net for kind of enterprise behind the kind of intranet kind of uh, applications? So, uh, the, the idea is it's a, how many people are using it for a private network right now? Yeah, but more enterprise customers. More enterprise users, right? Yeah. So, um, I, I've got kind of two answers to that. Um, one part is that enterprise users love StatusNet, right? Um, they love it because they can take our software, they can install it on their, uh, inside their firewall, and they can have a social network that works inside their university or inside their company or inside you know, their government organization. Totally awesome. People are really using our software like crazy for this. Motorola is probably the one that people know the most. Uh, very big company. They've been publishing a lot about it because it's their main, main part of their social media strategy within their company. But other companies like Intuit, um, let's see, SAP, uh, Sun ha has a system. Uh, there are, you know, uh, there are quite a few. Some of them have asked us not to use their names, so I don't use their names for promotion. Other ones are uh, customers, um, but there are, you know, big American banks, Euro big European banks. Uh, large American retailers, uh, companies with hundreds of thousands of users who use StatusNet internally. And we provide commercial support for those companies if they, if they want to. Um, we also provide uh, uh, the cloud service for that kind of company. Um, however, our cloud service tends to be more for small and medium-sized companies. So the kinds of people that want to have uh, their own, that want to use a cloud service uh, tend to be you know, the 100 to 1,000 employee uh, companies rather than the 100,000 to 300,000 employee companies. But yeah, there are a lot, and, and they're very interested in our software. Thanks. There's. Uh, you didn't saw, say why you chose PHP. Is it for the install base? What's that, the PHP? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's exactly for the install base, right? So it's uh, for that low-end uh, hosting system. Uh, they're going to have PHP. They're going to have MySQL. That is like you have to look long and hard to find a hosting system that will not let you have PHP and MySQL running on it, right? So um, the idea is that uh, anyone should be able to take this software and install it somewhere. And uh, PHP and MySQL is that lowest common denominator. That said, there's also a huge number of uh, LAMP developers in the open source community. And uh, they're the kind of people who are going to be taking our software and using it. So that's the other reason we went for, went for LAMP. Hi, Evan. Another one. Um, what's, um, or is there any kind of learnings that you could pick up from JQ, or, or is kind of JQ a kind of dead project for you? Is there anything that we can learn from JQ? Or JQ can learn from you? Yeah. Uh, I think that JQ is a really cool system. Um, I think that, uh, <clears throat> let's see, how do I say this diplomatically? Um, I think one of the things that uh, we've learned about microblogging say, and, and status sharing in the last couple of years has been that um, it's really useful uh, away from the SMS world. Um, it's not as SMS dependent as people thought when, when JQ and Twitter were, were started. And uh, I think that um, you know, one of the things that uh, we're kind of tracking now is how that microblogging world is more web oriented than SMS and, and mobile texting oriented. Um, I think Jaiku uh, is kind of keeping up there. I, I love their software. They have a great uh, piece of software. There are some things that I'm not crazy about. Like I don't like the fact that you know, I make a post and then you comment on those posts. I think that a post is a post. But besides that, I think it's a really great system. The big, you know, big difference between Jaiku and, um, and StatusNet is that Jaiku is written in written for Google Apps for uh, with, with the Google App Engine. And so there's a um, kind of a narrow installation uh, point there. If you want to uh, install it somewhere else, you have to use the kind of Django emulators and everything to make the GAE GA system work. And I think that's a little bit high end for a lot of folks. Um, but besides that, I'm really excited to see uh, Django, uh, excuse me, <laughs> JQ uh, hopefully support the O status. Um, I know that uh, James Walker, who's uh, recently joined uh, Stasnet, is eager to make some uh, submissions to some of the Django-based systems. Uh, TypePad Motion is another one that's based on Django, um, and, and see if we can get them all using the uh, the O Status network. So 